So since we are already running short of time, I think we will start the proceedings. So, Honorable Chairperson, uh, Dr. Shazia Manzul, our senior elite, and uh, currently working as Associate Professor, uh, Department of Social Work, University of Kashmir. Our valued invited guests, estimate faculty, staff, and your students, a warm good afternoon to all of you. It's a privilege to be a coordinator of this preliminary session one of this uh, national conference. I, on behalf of our worthy principal and the uh, whole uh, staff of this college, welcome you all in this two-day national conference on social protection for inclusive development. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of motivated and dedicated uh, colleagues at this institution. So among us, we have Dr. Shazia Manzur who will serve as chairperson for this plenary session one. So let me start with a brief introduction of our chairperson, Dr. Shazia Manzur. Dr. Shazia Manzur is an associate professor in the Department of Social Work, University of Kashmir, and is currently uh, serving as head of department. She has completed her master's in social work and doctorate from Aligarh Muslim University. 
The Vishaja research interest includes microfinance, gender, disability, and public health. Dr. Shaja has published several research articles in the journals of international repute and has also presented research papers in various national and international conferences. Besides this, Dr. Shaja has received a prestigious fellowship, SUSAI, study of United States Institutes, and her host university was University of California. She has also been the principal investigator and co-investigator of several research projects funded by ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research, ICSSR, Indian Council of Social Science Research, and DSK, Department of Science and Technology. Dr. Shaja is a visiting faculty of many world class institutions. So, this was a little bit of brief introduction about our chief person, Dr. Shaja Manzoor. Now, I would like to request our uh, faculty member, Dr. Iqbal sir, to please facilitate our chairperson, Dr. Shazia Manzoor, with a moment too. With the permission of our worthy principal, I would like to hand over further proceedings of the preliminary session to our chairperson, Dr. Shazia Manzoor. Please come on stage. here, scholars, students, and the faculty members. Uh, since I have been given a, uh, a task to uh, chair a session, which is uh, very important because, as you know, that the conference is on social protection uh, for an inclusive development, and uh, how important social protection is for us, everybody knows, because when we talk about social protection, how we have to deal with the inequalities, the kind of vulnerabilities which we face every day. Because when we talk about any inequality, many a times uh, sitting in our very cozy homes and offices, sometimes we do ignore all these things and see things from our own lens. That sitting in this AC room, maybe we may not have that kind of feeling what is happening, what kind of inequalities. Uh, women and children working in brick lanes or people who are in slums or children who have to travel long distances, people with disabilities. So like, we need to really open our eyes and see inequalities exist today also. Although we have seen that how much money, how much schemes have come, and when we talk about social protection, there is no end. When we start, even if we see post-independence period and count the programs, I think there is no end. Every five years, every six years, we have new programs coming. Names are changing, targets sometimes reach, sometimes not. So this conference, uh, at the very beginning, I would say it's a very important conference for people who belong to the field of social sciences because it talks about something which can have an impact at the grassroots level. Uh, without wasting uh, much of the time, I would just like to say that this uh, session, in this session we have five presenters. Uh, and uh, the first uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Jeevan Jyoti Mohanty. Uh, and uh, they'll be talking about social protection as a safety net. Uh, he's from Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India. Uh, before I ask them to start the presentation, I would like to introduce them. Uh, Dr. Deepan has over 16 years of rich and varied working experience in social security for informal sector. 
Uh, they have worked on finance, gender equality, micro-enterprises. Currently, he is working as a team leader in the technical support unit, TSU, at the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. Uh, prior to joining the ministry, he was associated with SIDBI, NABAR, Rural Micro Pension Program and Dunn Foundation. Academically, he holds a PhD in Economics and MBA in Development Management. He has published more than 25 research papers on microfinance, micropension in both national and international journals. I welcome you, sir, and uh, uh, with your CV and your uh, such a great experience, uh, we will be all benefiting by your experience because you have worked at the grassroots and have touched very important areas which come under the social protection. Uh, I welcome you, and uh, there will be eight minutes of the presentation. You you have to write up your whole uh, presentation in eight minutes, and then we can have some brief question answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Okay, uh, very good afternoon all of you. Uh, Extreme Chairperson, uh, Dr. Manju, uh, Head of the Department of Social Work, University uh, of Kasmi, Dr. Ali and Dr. Wani. So at first, uh, I also uh, congratulate the government college where you are the principal, so who has organized this uh, the event. And also I extend my heartful thanks to Dr. Mustaq. Assistant Professor, Department of Social Work, who have invited and uh, brief all this, what is the technical session uh, and uh, what is the going forward uh, these things. He is nudging for the last one month for this uh, uh, for this event. So I am really happy and uh, fortunate uh, to be here um, uh, for this national conference on the social protection and the inclusive development. So uh, I hope my uh, voice is uh, properly audible and uh, I am going to share my presentation. This is a very brief presentation. So uh, uh, initially I want to talk a uh, two topic, but uh, Musa has requested me to talk in the two different topic uh, on the social security, the thing. So I'm going to share my presentation. Please uh, let me know that whether my presentation is visible or not. So sharing is, uh, is not there. Uh, can you uh, permit me the sharing? So you are really so you are really co-host. You can share your presentation. So you please share your presentation. Okay. Uh, is it uh, um, visible? Yeah, so can it's you? Now, it's coming. It's presenting. Okay. Yeah. The slide is coming. So I'm going to talk about uh, two aspects of uh, uh, two topics uh, broadly. First one is the micro pension for the old age uh, income security for the contract workers. So when I uh, talk about the pension, it's the pension for the informal sector workers or the pension for the rickshaw cooler or the auto driver or uh, can say that uh, vegetable vendors, the street vendors, these are the, the, uh, the segment whom I am going to talk about the pension. Basically, when I talk uh, the pension word, when it emerged, basically the people understand it is the formal sector, the government sovereign, state government sovereign uh, 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 pension. But for, for, for the informal sector, nobody have, uh, um, uh, like uh, they have a listen or they have, uh, if you are asked the uh, rickshaw puller or water driver or the taxi driver, whether you have a pension, he will laugh that uh, no uh, it, are you joking for that so we will talk about that the why pension is required or micro pension is required uh, for this informal sector workers when they are in the old age the second uh, topic i am going to cover that is Sonidhi Se Samriti. it is the one of the initiative by the government of india 
um, under the PM Sonidhi scheme, Prime Minister Street Vendor scheme during the COVID, um, it's emerged. Then how the safety net uh, to, for the street vendors and then their families who uh, uh, is address, addressing through this scheme. So um, uh, this uh, uh, this two area I am to talk. The first, uh, uh, why the pension is required? Uh, or uh, the Indian contest, uh, why uh, the micro pension or the pension at a large it is required for the informal sector work? If you see that, uh, if uh, the total um, the India population as on date, uh, so we consider it a young country because the 60% of our total population are in the age group of 15 to 59. So, so but after uh, but 30 years or 50 years, the scenario is going to be changed drastically. Today, the share of elderly population, the total is, uh, if you um, just uh, glance at the 2011 census, it is 9.4149% uh, of the total population. Say it is 10% uh, of the total population is elderly population. But by 2024, it is going to be 14%. And by 2025, it is ex expected it is at least 25% of the total population is the elderly population. Then annual growth of the population, it's rising at the percentage of 1.8%, while the senior citizen, uh, the growing at a 3.8%. So due to the uh, advancement of uh, medical science, because the life expectancy is uh, rising uh, like uh, anything. So uh, today in India, 70 years is uh, life expectancy. For the female, it is again more. That means uh, um, after retirement also, after the age of uh, 60 also, you are going to live another 10 to 20 years. So so um, what, what the next? How you are going to survive uh, at that time? Then the concern is again, that 92% of the Indian uh, workforce is the informal sector workers. So only 8% of workers, they have a, a kind of a social security or the pension scheme when it will take care of their old age. But, but the major chunk of the total working um, the population is in the informal sector, those who have a, don't, any kind of a social um, a protection or uh, social security uh, is there. Uh, then evidence also um, uh, uh, proved that the despite of the social security scheme by government, the entitlement is very low. Though there is many scheme of the social security scheme, but uh, it is reaching out or the and uh, giving to the um, uh, rich and the, uh, the ultimate beneficiary is very low. So if you will just uh, see that the uh, total workforce, uh, if you will, um, in the 2011 census, it was uh, 50 now. Uh, if it, the total workforce uh, current agent is of 523 million workforce is there. So you just uh, exclude this, uh, uh, the civil servant or the private uh, sector salary who is a uh, handsome salary is uh, they are getting. But those who have uh, any kind of either medical they have uh, or, or any kind of social protection is there. But uh, talk about the those who are not cover anything. And now in that segment, there is unpaid workers, those who are uh, either housewife or uh, these things, they have a, don't have any kind of um, uh, earning sources. Then there is just some segment of the population is there, the lifetime poor, either the dispute or they have a widow, they have a physical handicap. So, so these segment is also there. Then working age more than 60 years, that is also 40 million and self-employment high income so that is also uh, 30 million people is there where they can uh, survive if you were, were not giving any kind of protection but the major chunk who are the low income workers they are able to save but they don't have any kind of uh, uh, instrument where they can um, uh, uh, save that so these low income workers either it is a uh, the taxi driver or the, your auto driver, they can earn every day. So you say for 500, 600, every day they uh, earn, but they have don't have any kind of uh, which is really um, uh, um, uh, feasible for them to save for the long run. So this picture, if you can see that for the informal sector, 
basically they are uh, depend on the physical level so they once the age uh, is increasing they are the uh, working for day they were reducing because the physical uh, labor or they are um, intensity of work it is reducing say for the example the the 20 years age of people who have another 20 years to work the moment you uh, work um, your age is uh, growing then your income level is also reducing and your uh, 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 it is a proportionate to your um, uh, capacity or your uh, um, physical health along with the income so but in in space in it, it is opposite in case of the high salary professional like doctor lawyers or uh, other profession those who have a kind of a skill set the moment they growing their age their experience and their income is also um, high but in case of informal sector who completely depend upon the manual or the physical labor the moment they are growing their age their income is deteriorating so that's why it is going to be very difficult for after their working um, after the uh, so what is the other option if you will ask those who want to have the pension scheme uh, what is your um, intake or what is the option for any kind of course if you will ask any poor or a rickshaw driver or the coolie or what is the he will ask that they will work throughout the lives which cannot be possible so i have just uh, uh, glancing uh, 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 just uh, in google that still 41% of elderly population they are working in spite of they don't have a physical uh, uh, capability to work but they are compelled to work for surviving so that means uh, there is a option as long as uh, you live you need to work the second one is you depend on the children so basically our our traditionally what we the, uh, the oldest people are taking care of by the children uh, they are mostly they are depending upon the um, male children but you see that the scenario is now changes it is uh, earlier uh, people or uh, the society are uh, the joint family system was uh, uh, prevailing now it's uh, breaking down to the nuclear family and now is a uh, most of uh, so, uh, uh, nano nuclear you can say that husband is uh, staying one of another uh, wife is staying another there is uh, no possibility to um, um, uh, taking care of the old age for the their parents Dr. Jeevan, can, Even uh, you can you please uh, you know you are just one i know that uh, the work is very important and uh, it's very interesting for all of us but can you please uh, uh, conclude and uh, talk about your main findings or any recommendations related okay to okay so uh, uh, so these are the uh, uh, option for the uh, working uh, poor either it will depend upon the government or the uh, same things so so uh, overall why pension reforms require in the low income as i have already summarizing that people is uh, living the longer life expectancy the risk of longevity is very high because of uh, low physical capability and low income then the, there is a uh, fading away the joint family system so steady manner so that's why the uh, intensity for the uh, income security is very much required then additional healthcare expenditure is advantage once you will attain the age of 60 then your medical expenditure or healthcare expenditure is going to high so to meet out to that, these things you also require some kind of income security then we think the desire of a superior lifestyle and the post retirement period what now what you are with the living style may not be possible in the after 60 so to maintain this tempo so you will require a kind of a income security reform and other than that the government cannot burden uh, or cannot uh, take uh, the uh, liability of the uh, the segment of uh, such such a vast segment of the population of old age so these are the uh, basically this is the understanding of how the in, in indian context of pension system is working so this is the uh, uh, basic introduction what is the micro pension it's basically the financial arrangement to build asset for the old age income 
so when they refer to no, is is come back pension completely is a contributed the people need to contribute for their old or they will save for their old age nobody will um, um, assist you after the old age so you have to think uh, now from day one you know, of you yourself this is the uh, basic difference i will share the uh, ppt for the uh, major learning so that uh, the difference is the micro pension the traditional pension product so basically so i will uh, touch on the one point only that uh, demand for micro pension is a zero but the need is 100% so whenever you will ask any informal sector workers or any rickshaw puller or any construction worker so they know that there is a, the need for pension after the 60 but there is a demand is very because it is a very long term have to save another 30 years or 40 years and there is a not such a customized product or micro pension in india still now even if the government has given auto pension yojana or an npas Which is the, uh, which is which is uh, the different uh, segment? It is addressing the issue of uh, that, uh, but it is not for that segment which we are going to talk. So the demand still it is a pension. You are uh, and my pension is uh, uh, considered in the uh, in the uh, financial instrument. It's a pool product. It's not a pool product. The loan kind of thing. It is a pool product where the people will go and ask for the product. If your micro pension insurance, the the agent will. in force you to take Dr. that Sheevan, can you please uh, wind up yes just... so this is my last slide so uh, uh, if uh, if a time permit then i can uh, talk about the other program otherwise uh, uh, this is the first uh, um, uh, thing if you permit a uh, two minute no, then no, i will talk I about the uh, another scheme which is coming from you uh, because uh, we have other presenters also and we also yes, yes, i understand some I questions from the uh, okay here. okay So, any question? Um, uh, then, uh, yeah. Uh, so, thank you very much for a very, uh, very wonderful presentation, and of course, talking about a very different thing because we know that informal workers, and as they age, as they go into that elderly bracket, income comes down, and I think uh, we need to come out, uh, come up with something different where we talk about how to secure them, how to protect them. Because the families are now shifting from joint to nuclear family, so they are hardly anybody to take care of people at that age. Thank you very much. Very wonderful presentation. Before we close this presentation, can we have some any 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 opinion, any any question uh, for the uh, for, for the participants? Any uh, any 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 observation or any any question regarding the. Uh, a very important concept which talks about safety net for informal workers while they go into aging and dr jeevan has given a lot of good recommendations and what yeah, uh, i have a question there uh, there are number of uh, private companies also there in the market why should not government is taking steps to put these uh, old age people into that bracket not not what will do i will not waste the other time so so um, i have um, i'm just uh, putting my number so any question i can happy to respond it uh, immediately so i'm putting because uh, the voice is not properly audible uh, Can you please repeat your question, uh, sir? Are you listening there? Yes, yes, please. Uh, sir, there are private organizations already working on uh, the production of old age uh, people through different schemes. Is there any policy by the government? Yes, yes, yes. I got your. Uh, there is a lot of. Uh, pension product is available in the market, which is offered by the private uh, agency. 
but the premium and the uh, conditional um, and the eligibility criteria and the condition is not that much of a suitable or uh, it is not uh, suitable for this uh, segment what we are uh, talking if it is a uh, uh, say uh, if it is a um, uh, insurance product or a mutual uh, fund product then it their uh, security or their return is not guaranteed so whatever you are going to give and if you will not ensure that this is much is going then nobody will buy mm -hmm. and the uh, <coughs> the uh, premium which is very high that at least 500 to 1000 rupees per month you, you need to save otherwise it will not uh, and it will basically this is a formal segment only they will go to this because uh, you need to have a bank account uh, along with uh, your all uh, kyc norms or uh, your internet banking everything you need to do so we, we are talking about a person or the informal sector workers which is is very difficult to on part of uh, to save at least 1000 rupees to get a, 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 a desirable pension in the, after the 60 if you will talk about the 5000 rupees after 60 there at the amount will not be suitable or it is not visible thank to you uh, thank you dr jeevan of course like your answer because we, we need to be very careful informal workers they do not have a regular income so why do private sector will think about that yes a very important question it needs further deliberations but time is very really, thank you very much for giving a very enlightened presentation uh, i on behalf of the uh, convener and the principal and the other uh, team members here congratulate you for a very great presentation thank you very much thank you thank you uh, so we are now heading towards the second presentation uh, the second presentation is dr pradeep rava associate professor from center for livelihood and social entrepreneurship tata institute of social sciences i welcome you sir uh, he'll be talking about social protection and the inclusion of excluded, particularly SCs, STs, and disabled. Before I uh, uh, we start the presentation, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Pradeep. Today is an associate professor with the Center for Livelihood and Social Entrepreneurship. Uh, he has worked as an assistant professor and assistant director with the Institute for Public Policy, Center for the Study of Social Exclusion, and Inclusive Policy, National Law School of India. Uh, Assistant Professor Azim Premji University. As a development practitioner, he has worked with Sri Nivasan Services Trust of TVS Motors. Dr. Pradeep has coordinated a number of conferences and seminars, such as Quest for Equity, conducted various studies, and have been instrumental in breaking down the draft Devdasi Relief and Resettlement and Rehabilitation Act 2018. He was also the project director of the ICSSR funded major projects on the searching rationale of SC sub plan and tribal sub plan. Dr. Pradeep has published uh, many articles, book chapters, and books on educational, social justice, governance. I welcome you, sir, and uh, you can start your presentation. You have eight minutes for your presentation, and fo followed by question answers. Please, Dr. Pradeep. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. well, thank you. I'll uh, straight away start with my uh, presentation. I think uh, I am audible to all of you, and uh, yes. I think I have the permission to share my uh, uh, PowerPoint. Can somebody help me in granting yes, yes. the permission? Yeah, you will be able to present it now. You can share your PPT, sir. Please share your PPT. Hope it's visible to all of you. Okay, great. I think I'll uh, straight away uh, go with uh, my topic, social protection and inclusion of excluded, particularly scheduled caste, scheduled tribe and the disabled. And uh, all of you know that it is humanly impossible to speak about these three uh, important uh, categories uh, uh, to finish about their uh, social protection and the inclusion policies and the data related to them within the eight minutes. But what I'm trying to do at this point in time is to give a broader overarching framework which will help us in understanding the complex uh, issues related to these uh, uh, marginalized communities, scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, and the disabled. Because uh, now there are a lot of uh, Supreme Court interpretations which are coming out, which are also like saying that whatever the provisions which are applicable for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes could also be applicable for the disabled, along with other important provisions to them. So I, I, I want to. Uh, 
bring uh, the point uh, very clearly over here and then I will proceed. Because when you take the population of scheduled caste and scheduled tribe in, in our country, uh, the uh, uh, statistics which are available to us is a uh, gross aggregate uh, percentage at the national level. When you go for the state level disaggregation, it is a very complex kind of issue. And I don't want to enter into that uh, 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 conflict zone at this point in time. Why I am saying this? Because uh, uh, many of the states are also like trying to bring the legislations relating to internal classification and reservation regarding scheduled caste, scheduled tribe in our uh, in our country and in respect to states. And then both state governments and the central governments have equal legislative power along with registered general uh, along with uh, uh, our parliament. So this is a this is a this is a conflict area. That's why I don't want to delve into disaggregated data at this point in time because most of the time the communities might not agree with the data which the state is giving it to us. Since we did not conduct any kind of uh, caste census after 1931, it will be humanly impossible for us to tell that which community, which caste group is in what number in what state. So that kind of disaggregated data is not available. It is very gross, net or an average data which is available. To take an example, like if you go for a proportion of SCs in 2001, we say that 16.2 or something. When you move to 2011, we see about 16.6. Very marginal increase, but when you go for uh, the realities at the root level and then want to look at the community's experiences, there's a significant increase in the population which never gets documented because of the technicalities in the population enumeration which you adopted and we don't have the latest census in 2021 because of obvious reasons, COVID related reasons as it's reported. But at least in case of uh, disabled persons with disabled people, like we have data from the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment which says that around 2.21% of the total population is uh, are, are, are disabled and then you can see the total 2011 data which also like many of the organizations are also like contesting that these are the not the uh, correct data because when you are trying to aggregate at the national level, the scenario is different. So let me then, uh, when, when I'm having the complexity of not taking uh, the data which I'm able to agree at this point in time from any lenses, let me take a, a, a policy lens. So when I speak about the policy lens, it is obviously the meta policy of the country which is the constitution of India. From the point of view, let, let us look at our preambular, uh, the, the nature of our preamble, which forms the basis for the better policy in this country, which when it speaks about the social protection, it includes very interestingly both the public and the private efforts, which are designed to reduce the poverty and vulnerability uh, for the people to participate in labor, mar uh, labor market and the risks associated with it. So basically we are speaking about economic and social risks which are involved with this community. Internationally, we are looking at how the international agencies such as UNICEF uh, are articulating around this whole concept of social protection and its reflection in the Indian context is basically we have to go back to uh, the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights in 1948 because that coincides with our making of Indian constitutions. Both have an interesting journey, the evolving of Indian constitution and then the coming of a UDHR document share a lot of common things. If you read UDHR document in, 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 in alignment with our constitution of India, we find a lot of common features. So it becomes very uh, important for us to trace the journey of the Indian constitution and UDHR together because UDHR gives a lot of interpretation the social protection measures for the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, and then also for people like disabled people in our country. The whole concept of justice, liberty, equality, and fraternity becomes the key in uh, realizing this entire aspiration of uh, social protection. Since I come from the domain of uh, livelihood, uh, uh, livelihoods and social protection domain, let me uh, uh, flash this important uh, uh, enabler, which we always like speak in our livelihood studies, is about sustainable livelihood frameworks. But if we speak about these, these, these four or five important capitals, human capital, social capital, financial capital, and then cultural capital as the basic enabler for these marginalized communities to stand against the context of vulnerability, shocks, and then seasonality. And then how our institutions play an important role in uh, through the policies and legislations to enhance the livelihood outcomes of these communities. 
so uh, i think these are the popular images which always gets shown in most of these uh, platforms or even our students use them to demonstrate the difference between equality and inequity and when it comes to the uh, the situation of reality i think the first uh, uh, picture uh, demonstrate that is the uh, kind of situation we are having and the, the extreme uh, side we have this whole scenario of liber uh, liberation for these communities which is very difficult to be uh, discussed in our uh, context so basically i am trying to flash this uh, uh, picture when we speak about these scenarios of inequality and inequity because uh, 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 because uh, you have to uh, make sure that the tree is been bent towards those marginalized and historically vulnerable communities and then the food should go towards them so then if we take that let us let us see this with the international commitment we have sustainable development goals uh, where i think the uh, goal number 10 speaks about reduced inequalities right and i think that becomes the important intellectual for us to examine the other provisions no poverty zero hunger good health and well being if you keep all those things i think the uh, the goal number 10 becomes very important when it comes to the question of shadow caste tribes and then the uh, disabled uh, communities so uh, i'm also like uh, flashing the international human rights framework which is very important along with the national protection systems uh, that's where i was uh, making this argument that we have to read the uh, the uh, whatever the provisions are there for the shadow caste and shadow tribes along with the national protection system let me now come to the national protection system which is very important to be discussed at this point in time at the national level like you have an executive legislature and judiciary which plays a very important role in formulating the policies for the shadow caste shadow tribe and then and with respect to the uh, physically uh, disabled uh, communities so so to say like you have also like state level efforts uh, some states you have uh, uh, bicameral legislature where you have legislative assemblies and legislative council and then you could see that the uh, policies related to shadow caste schedule try and the disabled communities are struggling wherever like you have these bicameral legislature at the state level right something with the central government agrees and then you will see that the state government is not in agreement so let me directly now come to what are those important provisions for the schedule caste and schedule tribe in uh, in in our country i think the basic spirit is article 15 and article 14 where now we are speaking uh, about uh, uh, also like giving the reservation in private sector if uh, states desires to uh, provide the reservation for the people who are coming from the schedule caste and schedule tribe background article 15 and 16 can be uh, uh, interesting interpretation for giving the uh, reservation even also in the private sector basically like most of the time we speak about uh, the affirmative action policies and reservation policies through the article 15 and 16 article 15 like basically we speak about giving some concession or giving uh, uh, preference for people from scheduled caste and scheduled tribe background in the admission and article 16 basically speaks about giving special representation and reservation in the appointments of post for the uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribe i understand to be can, can you please can you please conclude uh, because uh, like it will take a lot of time if you explain us the uh, how article 14 15 and 16 is kind of connecting to the production of scsts can you please conclude and give your final uh, recommendation your observations so that we can conclude and have some questions from the audience a very important area is yes, so, it, it, it yeah. require a lot of time yeah. i'm sorry to cut you in between but i think then i'll uh, come directly to the conclusion yes. before yes, i yes. i go for go for the substantial argument <laughs> so uh, the the uh, substantial argument i was planning to make was that uh, the for the uh, social protection we also we 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 see a five pronged approach in our country social safeguards economic safeguards educational and cultural safeguards and political safeguards and service safeguards and in how these safeguards are being enacted through policies and legislations in our country so basically i am trying to make an argument saying that whenever these safeguards are been rooted now the argument gets shifted because there is a lot of confusion about what is backwardness altogether and whenever like you have this discussion about social backwardness people want to like try this with this whole criteria of economic backwardness so like you have seen the case of ewf which is now been countered against the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe reservation i think that kind of accommodative politics 
is not helping in overall social protection of people from scheduled caste scheduled tribe and then also from the people from the uh, uh, people like who are belonging to the disabled kind of category that's why the state is not coming out with the exact number of people like who belong to each of these categories which is hampering the entire planning and then the policy formulation process i think it's the lack of lack of the framework both at the central and then the uh, state level which is Uh, uh, which is which has been big hindrance at this point in time to ensure the social, economic, and the political safeguards for these uh, uh, communities. Similarly, uh, when you look for uh, the other important provisions, such as uh, Article 17, which speaks about uh, 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 protection against uh, untouchability, which is basically being rooted to protect the scheduled caste communities against the practice of untouchability. the scheduled caste community is not uniform across india they have been included based on the uh, three important markers where caste becomes one of the important factor along with that like you also have the racial features and then also the tribal characters also have been added because of that the confusion prevails in identifying who are scheduled caste so basically my argument is that uh, uh, the markers of identifying who is scheduled caste who is scheduled tribe and who is a disabled person is a contested in most of the uh, judgments which have been coming out but at least in case of uh, a person with disabilities through the act of 2016 the argument is made that uh, it is evolving and in dynamic concept but on the other hand the concept such as scheduled caste or scheduled tribe you can't have that uh, definitions in any of those uh, judgment because the Uh, we go back to uh, the uh, arguments which are before independence we go back to the arguments of pune pact and then what happened after the pune pact kind of argument so it is a, a complex terrain at this point in time uh, so now like to just to uh, counter uh, uh, counter uh, argue that uh, uh, there are uh, there are disabilities which are in the Uh, uh, act of 1995, 1995, you have seven uh, types of disabilities. Now you say that there are 21 uh, types of disabilities which have been identified, and these uh, schemes and programs such as Dindal Upadhyay uh, scheme for rehabilitation of the disabled people, you spoke for giving the provisions for those 21 uh, varieties of disabilities, which is not possible in the context of scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. So. Uh, uh, On a uh, on a very plain note, we say that it is the responsibility of the state and central government. But you have lot of these international uh, agencies, which also like plays a very important role in setting the discourse related to the social safety uh, uh, safeguards for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. So that's where this complex uh, uh, network of stakeholder. Uh, I am just concluding, uh, uh, saying that. Uh, Uh, we have misinterpreted this whole uh, idea of political representation and political freedom with this whole idea of social justice and social protection and we are still in the uh, very uh, deliberation stage of this whole concept of social protection and then economic protection is not the remedy for the uh, social backwardness for which these communities have been identified as scheduled castes and scheduled tribes i am quoting it from uh, Uh, dr pellisari's latest article on social policy in india where he basically speaks about that reservations cannot be panacea for the social protection of these uh, communities right so i just conclude thank you and thank you for giving this opportunity thank you thank you dr pradeep for it's a, i i think a very big discourse when we talk about social protection and uh, inclusion of scsps and you have been uh, Uh, it's very important that how you talked about the vulnerability shocks and when we talk about sustainable development goal, goal particularly the goal 10 which talks about reducing inequalities but we cannot uh, we cannot expect a particular goal to remove the inequalities if we cannot have an eye on other goals of reducing poverty and other dimensions and at the same time very important uh, which you discuss is how to define this backwardness because mo in most of the cases backwardness is only economic backwardness but i think that you touch upon social backwardness also and uh, and i what i could also understand is data how data is important and uh, the data which is there uh, we, we 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 plan policies and schemes accordingly that but we we need to address that we need to have a kind of uh, 
uh, detailed minuscule information about even that data. It's not in homogeneous category. And uh, a very important discourse, it uh, needed a lot of discussion. But uh, before I conclude this session, I would like to take some, uh, some observations, questions, because it's a very interesting area. Anyone from the audience here? Any any uh, any question? Uh, or you want to add something? Not necessarily always a question. Are the best ideas to save the time? Uh, the questions could be uh, given to Professor yes. Mustak as an intern, like he can yeah. already do. He can give a written rejoinder yeah. for whatever questions yeah. Mustak is Th giving. Thank you so very much for joining rejoinder. us from uh, that place. We, we, it's really a very important area which requires like one-to-one -one discussion. And I know that when we are online, offline mode, it's very difficult to do justice with whatever work you have done. Thank you very much and definitely uh, we'll be in touch with you because it's a very important area. We, uh, thank you, thank you. The people from social work uh, uh, connected with. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, <clears throat> let me move to, uh, from online world to the offline one because <laughs> I will take a deep breath because this online, I, uh, I know the world is going towards online. I think we, we cannot say no to online. but. Uh, I think that it has a lot of limitations and many a times it becomes a mockery. So uh, uh, I introduced my third uh, panelist, Dr. Shazian Malik. Dr. Shazian Malik is Assistant Professor from Center for Women's Studies and Research. I welcome you, ma'am. Uh, she'll be talking about social protection and the inclusion of excluded, particularly focusing on women and children. Uh, I would like to inform the uh, participants here that Dr. Shazi is presently teaching gender studies at the Center for Women's Studies and Research, University of Kashmir. Apart from teaching courses, she is serving as NSS program officer at the University of Kashmir. She has served as coordinator of the CWSR from uh, November 2022. She has worked as a research officer at the JNK State Resource Center for Women. She has a PhD in Women's Studies from Advanced Center for Women's Studies, Aligarh Muslim. She has presented many papers in international seminars, conferences, published more than 20 papers. She is the author of Women's Development Amid Conflict in Kashmir, a Social Cultural Study. She has also been a part of various international and national research projects. I welcome you, Shantia. You can uh, start your presentation and uh, eight minutes in total and follow the question answers. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shah and uh, the chair of our session. At the outset, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers of this event who have invited us. It's uh, very appreciable. Um, today, this lecture that I have been asked to uh, give here is it, it, it focuses on the crucial relationship of uh, social protection, inclusion, and gender equality. And this will be specifically in the context of Kashmir. So the lecture will highlight the Naya Kashmir Manifesto as an inclusive and powerful document that provided social uh, protection and empowerment to Kashmiri women. The, uh, my, my lecture will also discuss uh, the importance of developing the new policies uh, to address the changing socio-political uh, dynamics of the uh, region. So, social protection, as we all have discussed now in the previous pre uh, presentations also, that it is the right to uh, basic income, health, shelter, food, and uh, information. So, all of which that enables uh, uh, the people to survive, to support their dependents, and find a way out of uh, need and distribution. So this uh, right to social protection uh, comes to the people and it should be uh, available to, the, to all people uh, respective of their age, sex and uh, ethnicity. So um, uh, in the context of Kashmir, social protection is of particular significance due to the region's unique socio-political circumstances. Uh, this vulnerabilities faced by women in Kashmir are compounded by challenges uh, of uh, of um, displacement, insurgency, limited uh, resources available. 
So social protection measures can play a crucial role in addressing the gender equality. So uh, we have to provide women from all backgrounds, uh, uh, social protection in terms of livelihood, in terms of healthcare, nutrition, and protection from violence, all kinds of violence, which includes domestic violence, violence at the workplaces, etc. So today I stand before you to discuss the remarkable journey of women's empowerment in the region of Kashmir, specifically highlighting the role of social protection policies and programs over the years, the state of JNK, which was earlier a state, now a union territory, uh, it implemented various act, uh, uh, initiatives that were aimed at uplifting general marginalized communities, especially the women. And uh, this was done through education, employment, ownership opportunities. These efforts have contributed uh, improved gender required, you know, friendly statistics, which you can check in terms of education and employment. Uh, so to fully understand this impact, so we will have to go in, back to the historical context. The, the state of Jammu Kashmir, when it you know, embarked to the transformative path uh, with the introduction of Naya Kashmir uh, document uh, in 1947, so though it was drafted in 1944, uh, before the partition. So the primary objective of Naya Kashmir was to enhance the standard of living, uh, uh, the communal wealth and eradicate social divisions. Uh, within the region. So the comprehensive plan as such had two components. One was the constitution of JMK and the second was national economic plan. So overall, uh, you know, uh, the constitution was about the basic rights and the overall functioning of the government, how it will look like, what will be the structure. The national economic plan laid out the goals of planning and, uh, you know, uh, the, it presented an outline of, for a planned economic model. It, notably, this economic model contained specific provisions for women and peasants and laborers. So it was very inclusive at that point of time. It, it, it also uh, you know, talked about the upliftment of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in JNK. Naya Kashmir uh, in that sense was much ahead of time. And in fact, Jammu Kashmir was the only state in India that successfully implemented radical land reforms, debt cancellations, universally, you know, universal free education. So Article 12 of this Naya Kashmir uh, even guaranteed equal wage for women and men, a right that would only be enshrined in the mainstream, you know, Indian land, Indian uh, constitution much later through the Equal Remuneration Act of 1976. So building on the principles of Naya Kashmir, the state took a remarkable step in 1983 by reserving 50% of seats in uh, medical education across all specialities for women. And this bold move aimed uh, to enhance women's access to healthcare services. Additionally, half of all seats in engineering college in, uh, were also reserved for women. This, that's also in the affirmative major uh, that was unique to Jomo and Kashmir. So these policies and interventions, as you can see, had a profound impact on the status of women. And the data, if you see the census highlights, so we see that uh, in 1961, we, we had a very meager population that was uh, you know, literate, especially the Muslim women. And then we see that from 1961 to 1981, there was a 20% uh, you know, jump. And uh, to 2001, there is a 48% there is jump, so which is very huge. And then uh, moving onwards from 2001 to 2011, we see the growth there, but we see the pace of the growth has declined. And that is obviously because of the situation that we have been through. So while this women's uh, you know, uh, it, literacy has increased, overall you know, development never you know, uh, uh, stopped, because there was a permanent uh, social protection policy provided in the constitution, provided in the government you know, uh, structure. So it, it, though it excluded certain uh, vulnerable women, like uh, you know, the, the disparities are there uh, between the categories of women in Kashmir, for example, the lower socioeconomic uh, backgrounds like Hanji, Hanji women, and then 
the tribal women, for example, the Gujars and Bakarwals. So they have experienced significant discrimination in this process, and uh, the, uh, you know it has uh, also limited the access to their resources, uh, you know, healthcare and education and other basic necessities. So to address these challenges and to promote the gender equality and social pr protection for these excluded women in Kashmir and in general also, it's essential to adopt an intersectional and transnational feminist perspective. This perspective recognizes that women's experiences are shaped by various intersecting factors like uh, socioeconomic status, uh, gender, st uh, caste, religion, ethnicity. For example, many of the Hanji women the example. So they don't have this problem of domestic violence much. But uh, you know there are problems of employment. There are problems for uh, you know of other kinds. So we, you can find many women who are who have very higher you know incomes and are empowered in terms of employment. But there is a lot of domestic abuse happening. So you you know they are not empowered in that sense. So to make them uh, you know all empowered, you need to work on all sections. So the policy should be relevant in that way. So, um, so this uh, I I want to highlight it uh, here that uh, Dr. Shanzia, can you please two yes, minutes and be yeah. So we must acknowledge that you know the recent years we have seen the development pace has slowed partly due to the challenge posed by the post insurgency mm -hmm. period and moreover the revocation of Article 370 uh, has you know uh, which had granted this special status and due to which this social protection was given. It, it becomes imperative to revive and adapt the social protection policies uh, for women in Kashmir to align with the changing circumstances. So, uh, what, so it, to, to conclude, these uh, you know these were the state-led feminist programs, social protection policies, and affirmative actions. So these uh, were undeniably transform, transform, they transformed the status of you know, women in Kashmir. Uh, they have elevated the status of women uh, in terms of you know, literacy and other uh, things. So that the progressive vision needs to be sustained. We, uh, you know, we, we should move forward uh, and, and it is essential to build upon these achievements and revive the policies in, in terms of that. And I will take this opportunity uh, to uh, request Dr. Shazia, who is the head of social work in my colleague in, in University of Kashmir, to uh, initiate drafting a policy for uh, you know women in Kashmir. Uh, it, it, you know, as the Union Territory has been formed, and then we have new challenge and new circumstances. So they, they could be uh, you know it, it would require a background research, a quality research, wherein uh, we can rope in a lot of academicians and. And then after the uh, you know uh, research findings are there, we can find out the parameters uh, you know wherein we need uh, to intervene and uh, advocate you know. and and after that we can have a policy document which can be uh, you know in later part of the period with the support of all stakeholders uh, through different tools we can then uh, you know present the policy document to the honourable lieutenant governor. And which could be a service to the uh, whole, you know, uh, lot of women in the community. So with that, I would like to conclude. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. I would love to. I mean, this is not a paper presentation sort of thing. It is an idea that I wanted to share with you. So I would love to hear from you uh, observations, questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shazia. Uh, before we conclude, any uh, observations? Because. We, we shifted from uh, we earlier two presentations on micro uh, pension and then shifting towards uh, SC, STs, production, and now talking about historically the situation of women in Kashmir and the kind of different crusts and troughs of going high, coming down, and then sustaining that progress of vision. So, uh, any, any questions? Yeah, we have Kashmir now. How do you see this new Kashmir? Since long back, we have been said this. This is what I said that for me, it was more a political agenda that, than a real Kashmir and new Kashmir. So if we if 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 just compare that woman and with the present woman, we find that woman was more important. Now the present woman is more important. See, the and the kind of policies that we had there in the past and the kind of policy that we have right now. See, that was the crux of this you know, presentation. That 
it will take some time to see the impact. It's like the generation that is right now in you know uh, in the arena right now has taken the uh, privilege that were there uh, before 370 was revocated. So we are still in that you know we are coming out of that, and it will have repercussions in the coming years. And that's why I'm saying that before that you know time comes, we need to uh, pick up from that point, and we should not be disconnected with the, those achievements yeah, I mean, that are real. Yeah, and just, you know, uh, just, I mean, when we when we say that. Uh, it was a document that was published yeah. and they come up with the vision that they have they 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 completely new question. Now, see the present, if you just see the present situation, now we often play the game of now that the Nyaya Kashmir is completely new part, yeah. especially women, because women have been denied the right I to... I got your point. So, I got your other. point. So, what I am saying is that the policies cannot, you know, help by its own. So, unless and until you have a proper mechanism and a you know, a thought behind it. For example, you gave 50% of, you know, this is the only state that had 50% reservation for women in medical seats, nowhere else uh, this worked. It was only because there was another social protection that you had a, you had an autonomy, you had, you could decide on these things. You cannot do that now. So whatever is for other states, it's for you also. So, but uh, still, we can, as a, you know, as a community, as academicians, or, you know, uh, social workers are here, NGOs are here. So that's why I invited Dr. Shazia to initiate that, you know, we need to, you know, have a continuity with what we have achieved. What, whether it is less or more, that's not important. The important is that we have achieved something. So we need not to, you know, lose that in, in the process. Uh, I, I, I yes. know that... Uh, yes, second question. As per National Crime Review Report, yes. uh, 2021, I think, the rate of crimes increases uh, from 2021 uh, is about 15% mm -hmm. than the past. You are uh, thinking that it is somehow uh, interlinked to this uh, empowerment? See, upsurge, if you are talking about upsurge in the domestic violence case or the violence against women, the violence is out there. So if you are talking about that upsurge, then it's real. It has been there since last 15, 20 years. And scholars have agreed that it is because of the circumstances that the Kashmir, you know, Jomun Kashmir has been through. And it has impacted the, you know, it has impacted the masculinity, it has impacted the patriarchal forms in Kashmir, so uh, that that's not you know deniable. The violence against, and that is also one of the factors that because we are in a situation where violence against women is uh, you know surging at a very high rate, you need to revive the policies. You cannot have something which is not relevant to the place where we live in. So something which is relevant in other state cannot be relevant if, if there is you know Delhi is a major state. There can be different rules. Punjab is different. And Kashmir is that way. Dr. Shazia, can we have a, a question from? Uh, I know that this is a topic in which we all would like to, but I have to, uh, you know, I have been given the responsibility. It's very difficult. But can we have some questions from students? Yeah, please. Yes, of course. to the schools or colleges. 
So it took almost 35, 40 years for the government to establish a college for uh, you know, women, uh, much after the college for men was established. But all this happened because you know the students, say our teachers, they also work on it. But more important is that there should be policy. That's why you know I'm again and again insisting on this. That it's only the through the policy that everybody can work on it. So there were teachers, for example, koi, you know because uh, the families were not allowing women to go to the college. There were male teachers. There were you know other things. So to remove those structural barriers. They were, uh, you know, they took women from the community, they educated them, they trained them on their own, they gave them incentives and then they asked them to, you know, teach in those colleges. They were invited for that uh, kind of thing. So that's what we need to do today also. So these structural barriers, cultural barriers still exist in rural, you know, they have not been, you know, 50, 75 years back, they have not been able to reach there, but now maybe you can. They are more, in, they are more accessible now. So that's why I'm saying that we need to revise these questions. Okay? Uh, I, I, I think that uh, we, I know that we have many questions. I'm really sorry, I cannot take any question. We can have, we can please, we can have, uh, we, 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 we will meet again after this. I think panel discussion, Shazia is there. Thank you, Shazia. You, you talked about a very important thing, and I think that most of us will be thinking of contributing towards this. Uh, coming up with a policy, we have people from the uh, voluntary development sector also. Uh, certain things which are very important and the question from the student really very really nice it sees that you are already right. involvement from to the social work field congratulations dr mushtaq that because it's very important that the youth start thinking on that lines and coming out of the classroom thank you very much and i'm very sorry i i did not allow some questions we we, we can shazi just <laughs> next year to you you can please take this question yeah i let me move to the thank you very much shazi uh, Let's move. Uh, a very important thing about this session is that we have a variety of uh, like people working in different sector and uh, the, the, the overall panel has a very good combination of lectures. We are moving to another panelist, Mr. Firoz Ahmedwani. Uh, Mr. Firoz Ahmedwani is Chief Functionary Human Welfare Voluntary Organization. He will be talking about social protection and the overcoming of COVID-19 crisis. Uh, Mr. Firoz is a development practitioner and a consultant. He has more than 70 years of expertise in the development sector. He has worked with various international, national, local organizations and he is the founder of JNK based organization named Human Welfare Voluntary Organization. And he has worked on various social issues across Kashmir on child protection, women empowerment, urban development, environmental conservation. Of course, this lecture and this talk will be uh, because uh, we, it's uh, sometimes like staying in universities, colleges, and working at the development factor. There is a lot of gaps, and uh, the visions and the lenses are entirely different. So I think that it's very important to also know about your experience and talking about protection and the overcoming of COVID-19 crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shazza ma'am, and all the dignitaries on the dice and all the students. And uh, I think, you know, this uh, the session started before this session, the question which was put forth by our uh, student uh, is really, you know, what makes us uh, work on the ground and what makes us to think that there is a mismatch in the in the implementation. Not mismatch, but you know, implementation of these policies is not happening even if something has been uh, written before 70, 60 years or 70 years, but now it's not reaching to each corner of, of our society and that's where the role of us, the civil society, the, all of us who are, you know, who are part of this society comes in. So uh, I just wanted to, you know, take, take that, uh, this. So my topic, since my topic, um, you know, is, is about the overcoming of COVID crisis and all of us know how, how difficult it has been for all of us, the COVID thing. But uh, what we analyzed on the ground when we were working with, with people that, you know, we, we you know, when we see it in the social protection parameters within that. So what we found that, you know, during this, the delivery of, uh, you know, relief thing which happened during pandemic was largely influenced by the existing systems, the existing systems which were in place before COVID-19. And the most effective delivery system was found uh, in the food relief sector, the Amara PDS system had public distribution system. That was something which was found to be you know, really effective 
in terms of reaching out to the people. Although we, we were not able to reach out to all the people, as one of the presenters said, that there is this you know, informal wor worker, just come uh, middle missing, we both they have to do miss this karjata, the informal worker, it, it gets missed in a lot of things. I remember I was working in 2011 on the census thing in Delhi and uh, census jab ho raha tha, to uske baad we met the, uh, the, uh, the registrar general of, of uh, census and and we told told him that there are a lot of people who were missed out like although we tried our level best to include homeless people into that census we tried to uh, you know move uh, went into some of the red light areas and tried to bring bring out women from brothels and tell them to you know register into this census but then despite that, there were a lot of people in, in you know, we, whom we knew were missed out. And when we went to this uh, registrar general and he said that, you know, we know that as per the calculations and other things, that there are like four to five percent people who are left out. So when you see this four to five percent, it means around a, a, a 140 crores ki baat karenge, usme jab aap char panch percent so it's a huge number, it's a number beyond like jo aapki ek do states ki population ho sakti hai. So that's where the you know catch is that you know we miss from the policy point of view and then the real real actual jo ground pe hai we sometimes and many times